lift our voices together and sing with all our hearts.
Well, amen. Aren't you grateful we have a Savior we can trust this morning? It is good to see you here this morning. For those of you who are here worshiping in this place, thank you for being here this morning. And to those of you who are joining us online this morning on our broadcast, we are so glad that you have tuned in and you're worshiping Jesus with, with us right where you are. So whether you're there or you're here, thank you for being here. And we have come together today to worship the Lord Jesus. If you are not a part of the Highland family, we would love to connect with you. And so if you're watching online, there should be a, a little link that you can click that'll open a form. You just fill out the information that's there. We'd love to know you. We'd love to connect with you. We'd love to answer questions for you about the Highland family, about uh, anything that God happens to say to you during the service time today, or how you can connect with us as a church family. And uh, if you're in this room this morning and you're a guest of the Highland family, if you will just take a quick moment, pull out your cell phone, text the word Highland to 94,000, a little form will pop up for you as well. You fill that out, and we'll have that in a matter of seconds when you hit the submit button, all right? We'd just love to connect with you. We'd love to get to know you a little bit better. But let me again just say thank you on behalf of the Highland family for worshiping the Lord together today. Would you just take a moment and let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come into this moment aware of your presence Realizing, God, that today, because of the power of your Spirit, we stand as much in your presence as if you were physically here among us. And so, Lord, we thank you for that. And we thank you for the chance you've given us to come together in this place, to join together online to worship you. And God, because of the power of your Holy Spirit, wherever we are, whether we're here or watching from home, we stand in the very presence of the living Savior. So God, overwhelm us with that truth today. Let us sense the glory and the weight of your presence with us. And as we humble ourselves before you, Would you call out of our hearts the worship and the praise that you deserve? God, we can't do that on our own. We need you, God, even in these moments to move us to worship. We need you, oh God, to make the songs that we sing and the prayers that we pray and the attention we give to your word we need you, oh God, to make that mean something to us. So would you do that this morning, God? Would you be blessed by the time we spend in worship? And I pray, God, that as we exalt and we magnify the name of Jesus, our Savior, that we would leave this moment, that we would leave this time of worship much different than when we came in. God, I pray today that you would show us what it means to have hearts that love the Father. God, show us that today. And we pray in the name of Jesus, your blessings over this time of worship. And we pray it in his name. Amen. Amen. Just remain standing as we continue to worship the Lord together. I love the message of this great hymn. It's been modernized just a little bit. It simply says, He is the man of sorrows. He's worthy of our praise. Come on. Man of sorrows.
no hold on me whom the sun sets free always free and sing it again this song. Just a couple of weeks ago, we taught it for the first time. It's a simple hymn of our faith. He is our rock. He's our redeemer. Let's sing it together.
Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. You can be seated just for a minute. Let me again say how grateful I am that you're here. For those of you who are in this room and for those of you who are joining us online, thank you for tuning in and joining us in worship today. I am so grateful for uh, our leadership team here, and I'm very grateful uh, that in Brother BJ we have a worship pastor who better than any I've ever known or ever worked with uh, puts together our theology and what we believe biblically with the music that we sing. And I'm so grateful for his leadership in that. I was thinking about that as we were uh, singing those hymns a minute ago, older hymn in the first part of the service, and then just a minute ago in that new hymn. And you know, there are a lot of people who think all the great hymns were written by 1968, and there is uh, there's no other, uh, nothing else happening. But that is to suggest that God lost his creativity in 1968. There are, are, there's a whole modern generation of hymn writers rising up and writing new music for the church. And we need to learn those hymns just like we did the old ones when we were all growing up and sing them to the Lord as acts of worship. And we're so grateful for that. We did miss you last week. We've been on some days off, but I was here last Sunday. We just worshiped at Broadway and uh, had the opportunity to, uh, to be over there for the first time since March while Dr. Rod preached to you here in my absence. I'm grateful for his leadership anytime I'm away, uh, whenever he fills the pulpit for me. And it was good to be over there on Sunday and, and literally just to sit and listen to Brother Ryan preach to the Broadway family, and that was a lot of fun as well. So I'm uh, grateful for the opportunity to be back this morning, though. Let me invite you to take your Bible and open them with me to 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2, and we're going to begin to read together in just a moment in verse 15. 1 John chapter 2, and we're going to begin to read in verse 15. We have been in this series simply entitled, If... We've been looking at some of the places in the book of 1 John where John puts in this little word, if. He gives us a conditional statement. If is a small word with enormous impact. It is a small hinge that opens and closes huge doors in the Scripture. In our text today, it comes in the middle of verse 15. And the door that swings on this small hinge, this little two-letter word if, puts us on one side of a great divide, a great gulf, or the other. Now let me just say a word to you before we read this passage together. You've been so faithful in wearing masks as we've asked you to, and we're grateful for that because we want to keep everybody healthy. But if you are sitting around people who are strictly from your household, and you're not in less, less than six feet away from, uh, from uh, the, anybody who's not in your household, feel free to pull your mask off. I know they're hot. I told the first service crowd a few minutes ago that they drive me nuts, especially when I sing. I understand because every time I take a breath to try to sing, I suck my mask in, and they're not, they don't taste good. So anyway, feel free to do that now as we preach. Let me invite you to open your Bible. We've already talked about that. Oh, now stand with me, please, and let's read God's Word together, beginning in verse 15. John said, do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. The world is passing away and also its lusts, but the one who does the will of God lives forever. Dear Lord, this morning we thank you for your word and we humble ourselves before you as we read it and as we consider it together. And Holy Spirit of God, we pray that you would teach us from this truth that you inspired John to write for us so long ago. And would you teach us what you intended for us to know. God, I pray this morning that as we listen to your word, as we hear it proclaimed, as we, as we think about it and we consider it, God, let it not just be something we hear, but let it be something that changes our heart. God, let it be something that makes a difference to us. Not because of the preacher, but because of the truth 
Because the Holy Spirit of God has guided us into the truth of the Word. And Lord, we pray that that would be true today. And that we would leave more like Jesus than we've ever been before. And we pray these things in his name. Amen. Thank you. And you may be seated. Now this morning, if you will let your eyes wander back up to verses 12 through 14 in this same chapter, just right here in chapter 2, if you'll let your eyes wander back up to verses 12 through 14, you will find that John is writing to the early church about who they are in Christ and who they are becoming. He addresses believers at every point in their spiritual journey. If you'll just take a minute and let your eyes wander through those verses, you will find out that he writes to little children, he writes to young men, and he writes to fathers. Beginning in verse 15, though, John writes to them about the one thing that will keep them from becoming everything Christ has redeemed them to be. Now, let me, let me just step in right here and say that he's writing to people all through all across the continuum of spiritual development. He's writing to people who've not been believers very long. They're still getting anchored in their faith. He's writing to those who are in the prime of their spiritual life. They're fighting the battles that God has given them to fight. And he's writing to people who are older and more mature and wiser in their faith. And he's writing to them all through that continuum of their, their spiritual journey. And so now he comes to write to them about the one thing that will keep them from becoming everything that God intends for them to be. He spends some time in these verses talking to them about the world, talking about the world. And he begins in verse 15 with a clear command. Look at verse 15. He says, do not love the world, nor the things in the world. Now, the way he says it in the original language suggests it was something they had already begun to do. They'd already begun to love the world. Their hearts were already beginning to turn. They were beginning, it seems, to fall in love with the world. And so John says this to them, stop loving the world. Stop loving the world. Now, he is using that word world here that is used in the scripture in at least three different ways. So let me just tell you what he's not talking about. First of all, he is not talking about the world as in the created order, this created world, the beautiful world we have to enjoy, the things we see that remind us of the creative genius of a holy God. When we look at the world, we see the glory of God. When we consider the firmament of the heavens, we think about the glory of God. When we, when we just see the, the beautiful creation around us, it reminds us of the great God we serve. That is not what John is talking about. In fact, the hymn writer said it like this, this is my father's world. I rest me in the thought of rocks and trees, of skies and seas, his hands, the wonders wrought. So John is not talking about not loving the world in the sense of this created order. He is also not talking about the world in terms of those who inhabit the world. He's not talking about not loving people in the world. In a little while, when we leave this room, we will do as we have begun to do over the last month or so. We will quote the Great Commission. We are called to love people in the world. He didn't tell us to stop loving people in the world. He said stop loving the world. Now in Psalm chapter 24, the psalmist talks about this created order and the people who are in it. And he says it like this, the earth is the Lord's and all it contains, the world and those who dwell in it. So that is not what John is talking about. But interestingly enough, in this text, John does not tell us what he means by the world. That would suggest to us that the people he's writing to already knew what he meant by that. He had been their pastor. They had heard him talk about the world many times. I've been your pastor for 18 years. If somebody from the outside heard me say something like, 
You think this is easy? You come do it. They would have no idea what I'm talking about. But those of you who've been here a long time, you know that because you've heard me say that and you've seen that context for a lot of years. So John is the pastor, has been the pastor of these people. They've heard him talk about the world, so they knew what he meant. John is an old man now. In fact, he is the last of the Lord's original 12 apostles. And so he's remembering, I'm sure, what Jesus said about the world. Do you remember what Jesus told his disciples in John chapter 15 about the world? Listen, he said, if the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. That's what Jesus said to them about the world. And just a little while after Jesus made that statement, They heard the Lord Jesus praying what we call the high priestly prayer of the Lord Jesus in John chapter 17. And in that prayer, Jesus prayed for John. He prayed for the other disciples. And according to that passage, he also prayed for us. He said, I pray for all of those who will believe in me because of the word of these apostles. So he's praying for his disciples, but he's also praying for us. And listen to what he said in that prayer in John 17. He said to the Father, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. So the world he tells them to stop loving, according to the scripture, is very simply this present fallen world system. It is organized by the evil one, by Satan himself, to oppose Christ and his work in the world. It is the opposite of everything Christ stands for. In fact, John Phillips summarizes what John means right here by the world when he said it is human life and society with God left out. It is human life and society with God left out. And Phillips went on to say, the world is the devil's lair for sinners and his lure for saints. The world is the devil's lair for sinners and his lure for saints. But John does not just tell us, stop loving the world. Stop loving this fallen, godless world system of the enemy. He does not just say, stop that, without telling us where it is that we actually connect with and encounter this fallen world. So if you look back at the first sentence of verse 15, he simply tells it, it tells us like this. He says, do not love the world, nor the things in the world. This unseen fallen world system becomes real to us, listen, when the things of the world pull our hearts away from the Lord. I didn't put that on the screen, but I probably should have. This unseen fallen world system becomes real to us when the things of this world pull our hearts away from the Lord. Let me give you an example of that. In Luke's gospel chapter 12, Jesus was teaching them and talking to them about money and material wealth. And he uses a parable, a story to make his point. And he tells them the story of a man who was very prosperous. His fields had produced a harvest that was so great he had nowhere to store what came in. He had an abundant crop. And so the, Jesus tells them that this man tore down his barns and built bigger barns so he could store all of his goods. And when he had those barns filled up, he sat back and he said to his own soul, take your ease, you have great goods stored up for many years. He was placing his trust in what he had. And Jesus said he was a fool because he didn't realize that that very night his soul would be required of him. And none of what he had accumulated, none of what he had put in store in those barns, none of that was able to rescue his foolish soul from death. And Jesus said to the disciples, so is every man 
who amasses that kind of wealth for himself, who lays up treasures on this earth and is not rich toward God. We encounter this fallen world system when the things of this life pull our hearts away from the Lord. So, John doesn't leave us there just to think, well, what things is he talking about in the world? He gets more specific. And verse 16, John spells out three things that are, to use his words right there in verse 16, look at it, not from the Father, but from the world. Three things, not from the Father, but from the world. First of all, he talks about the lust of the flesh. The lust of the flesh. Now, with that phrase, John is describing the desires of our human flesh. We were created by God with certain desires. They are good desires for good things, but they are corrupted or ruined by our sinful nature because we are part of a fallen and sinful race. We have a natural tendency to go beyond what God intended when he gave us those desires. We don't trust God to give us what we think we need and what we think we so rightly deserve, so we give in to the sinful tendencies inside of us. We fulfill those God-given desires in a way that does not please Him. We step outside the boundaries of His authority because we think we know better what's best for us. That's why the good hunger that God gives us for food becomes gluttony, and it makes us crave the richest and the the, the best delicacies to the point that we are like the writer of Proverbs described, where we just can't do anything because we've eaten to such a degree that we can't even be active or do anything God's called us to do. It is this sinful nature, this lust of the flesh, that takes our need, our God-given need for shelter and presses us to more and more expensive and luxurious shelter that's so much more than we need. We crave ease and luxury and we go to the place where our homes become more than our homes. They become our status symbols, the way we want to be identified, that mark of success in our lives. It is this lust for the flesh that takes the desire for sex and takes it outside God's good design inside of marriage. It is this lust of the flesh that takes the calling in our lives to work and provide for our needs and those of our family and turns us into workaholics, always chasing just a little bit more, just one more deal that we think will finally satisfy us. It's the lust of the flesh that takes that good desire and corrupts it into sin. It is this lust of the flesh that takes the longing for connection that we all have to people who are like us and turns it into tribalism and exclusivism where we are guilty of hate the hatred of those who are not like us. It is the lust of the flesh that desire, God-given desire, corrupted by our sinful nature that leads to those things. But John doesn't stop there. He talks not only about the lust of the flesh, but in verse 16, he mentions the lust of the eyes. James describes the process of sin in our lives like this. Notice what he said. In James 1.14, he said, but each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. What we see with our eyes on the outside calls out to the desires that live on the inside and tempts us to sin. You see, Satan knows that we are created with God-given desires, and he also knows how easily our sinful nature can be tempted to fulfill those desires outside the will of God. Satan also knows how quickly How quickly we become dissatisfied with what God has provided for us. And how quickly we doubt his love for us. 
If he doesn't prove that love by giving us what we want or what we think we deserve, we become dissatisfied with what God has provided. He also knows that our eyes, our physical senses, are the gateway to our souls and the way into our hearts. That's why, that's why in our culture today, sex and sexually charged images are used to sell practically everything, even things that have nothing to do with it. That's why today you cannot watch an hour's worth of television without seeing a commercial that tries to normalize relationships God has already said are sin. That's why pornographers and marketers have invaded every social media platform. It's why parents have to be so careful and so watchful about the social media interactions of their family. That is why, listen to this, even the innocent, harmless posts of your friends could lead you to envy the life they have and to be ungrateful for what God has given you. Do you understand that? Because Satan knows how we're wired. And we could go on and on with examples like that. But Satan knows how we're wired. He knows we have those desires inside. And he knows how quickly our sin nature corrupts those into something God never intended them to be. And he knows that if he can just plant that image in our mind through our eyes and our physical senses, that it will then draw us away. Our, our own lust will draw us away into disobedience to the Father that's exactly what he's talking about right here. He talks about the lust of the flesh. And John then talks about the lust of the eyes. But he doesn't stop there. He goes on to talk about the boastful pride of life. Listen to what he said right here. When John refers to the boastful pride of life, he's talking about living for the shallow applause of men. The shallow applause of men. See, Satan knows that we have a desire to be admired, to be liked, to be thought well of by other people. Don't you? Don't you have a desire to be liked? I said that in the first service and everybody just looked at me, kind of like y'all just did. It's not a trick question. You want to be liked. We all do. It's a God-given desire to want to be liked, to want to be thought well of, to want to be admired. Satan knows that, so he takes advantage of that. He exploits that by telling us that if we'll just make enough or have enough or do enough or be enough, that everybody will like us, but even more than that, they will envy us because that's what we want, and that's what he wants us to want. We want to be the center of our world and the center of everybody else's world. He lies to us, Satan does, and fools us into thinking that our own resources will somehow be enough and that we can trust earthly things to get the love and approval we crave. That if we just have enough or do enough or be enough, we'll be something and people will look at us and envy us and we'll be the top of the heap, the head of the class, we'll be all that in a bag of chips. And he knows that temptation in us. James addresses the same idea in James chapter 4. He said, but as it is, you boast in your arrogance and all such boasting is evil. When you combine our God-given natural desires with temptation, suggestion that we fulfill them in an illegitimate way, and the idea that we've got this and we don't need him, it is a lethal combination spiritually. Give you an example of how this played out in the life of Jesus. Satan did this to him, tried to do this to him. In Matthew chapter 4, we read about the temptation of Jesus. Jesus has been in the wilderness now. He's been fasting and praying for 40 days alone with his father. And Satan comes to tempt him. And do you remember the first thing he said to him? And you're gonna, your mind's going to go to turn these stones to bread, but that wasn't first. 
See, he tried to attack Jesus at the point of his identity. He said, if you are the son of God, command these stones to be bred. Just before Jesus goes to the wilderness for those 40 days, he is in his baptism. And at his baptism, the heaven opened up. And the heavenly father said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And now Satan comes and attacks him at the point of his identity. And he said, if, he tried to cast doubt, if you are the son of God, right? He does that with us. If you really are the son of God. If you really are what the word of God says you are. If, if God loves you. If, plants that seed of doubt. But then, he went on with Jesus, and, and he got into this lust of the flesh idea right here. He got into this, this, this physical desire, if you are the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. And, and G, you know, Jesus refuted him with the Scripture every time. Satan didn't stop there. He, he took him to the pinnacle of the temple, and he said, he said, jump off here, and everybody will celebrate you because the Bible says that the Father will send his angels, and they'll bear you up, and you won't even strike your foot against a stone. And listen to what he'd have gotten. You know what Jesus would have gotten? He'd have gotten the cheap applause of the world. He'd have sacrificed the worship of the great multitude of the church forever for a moment of cheap applause from the world. And then the enemy took him to the mountaintop, and he got around to what he really wanted. He said, if you'll bow down and worship me, I will give you the kingdoms of the world. And fortunately, our Savior was able to fend off the enemy's attack, and he faced all that temptation and every other temptation that he faced his whole life here without sin. And we're so thankful for that. But Satan used these same things to try to draw Jesus away from the will of his Father, just like he does for us. But John lays out in clear and unmistakable terms the high cost of loving the world. John gives us two things. Write these two things down. He gives us a word of warning. He gives us a word of warning. There are two sentences in verse 15. In the second sentence, he gets around to that big little word, if. If, he said, if anyone loves the world. Literally, he's saying there, the way it's constructed in the language is, if anyone keeps on loving the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now notice what John does right here. He presents us with a binary choice. There are only two options. You either love the world or you love the Father, but you cannot do both. You either love the world or you love the Father, but you cannot do both. At the end of the Broadway hit Hamilton, after shooting Alexander Hamilton, Aaron Burr is reflecting on what he should have learned before it was too late. He and Hamilton, as you know, had disagreed on so much. That disagreement turned into hate and resentment and ended in the death of Alexander Hamilton in that famous duel with Aaron Burr. And in the musical Hamilton, Burr says, I should have known that the world was wide enough for Hamilton and me. He was talking about this inclusiveness that, that we ought to be able to coexist and, and live together in the same world. And, and, and that is true. I mean, it is true that the world was wide enough for Hamilton and Burr. But ladies and gentlemen, do not mistake this. The human heart is not wide enough for the world and the Father. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus is talking about material wealth, and he put it like this. He said to his disciples, no one, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You can't serve God and wealth. 
See, Jesus did not tell us that it would be difficult to serve two masters. That as you go through your Christian life, as you try to follow me, Jesus said, it's going to be difficult to serve two masters. You're going to constantly be doing a juggling act, but don't hang in there. You can do it. You, you, can, you can have it both ways. You can walk on both sides of the fence. You can, you can, you can juggle it. You can do it. That is not what he said. He didn't say you shouldn't serve two masters. He said we cannot serve two masters. It is not possible. We either love the world or we love the Father, but not both. The human heart cannot love the world and the Father. We don't have the capacity for that. One of the reasons why we are an, a, a more anemic church today than we ought to be is we've got a whole lot of people who are trying to live with one foot in the Word and one in the world. They think they can love the Father and they can love the world. But G, John says to us right here, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, it cannot be done. So I think John is addressing two groups of people here. I think he's addressing lost men who are revealed to be lost by their continued love of the world. If someone continues in that love for the world, unchecked, unmoved by the conviction of the Holy Spirit, and they remain unrepentant when they're loving the world, and the Holy Spirit of God begins to convict them, begins to work in their life to show them that that is sin, and they continue unrepentant in that, they are simply revealing their lost men and women. But I also believe that John is speaking here to believers who have stopped responding to the love of God. To believers who may have made a decision at some point to trust Christ, but they've stopped responding to the love of God. In other words, John was not suggesting that we can lose our salvation he was simply appealing to them and pleading with them not to fall in love with the world. Not to let the things of the world crowd out their love for the Father. To let loving the Father be the guiding principle, the, the, the mainspring of their life. He just didn't want them falling in love with the world. So he issues this Binary choice, this, this choice that there's only two options. You either love the world or you love the Father, but not both. But look at this, just for a minute, look at this, because John also gives a word of encouragement. In verse 17, he simply says this, The world is passing away and also its lust. The one who does the will of God lives forever. That phrase, passing away right there, in the original language, it means it's already in the process of self-destruction. The action has already begun. The procession, the funeral procession has started. The world and its lust, he said, are passing away. When we love the world... The object of our love is passing away. It is fading a little more every day. So you can, you can say, I, want, I just want to love the world. I'm just happy loving the world. Can I tell you this? You are loving an object that is passing away. The object of your love is passing away, and it will never satisfy you. It won't. But then he said, but the one who does the will of God lives forever. The one who keeps on Doing the will of God lives forever. When we love the Father, the object of our love is eternal. And we are building a life that will last and our hearts are filled with a love that will grow stronger and stronger for all of eternity. That's, that's what John says. He draws these two choices for us. You love the fading, fleeting, passing away world, or you love the eternal Father, the lover of your soul, 
who loved you first. You know what we've done for a long time in the church when we've preached on this passage, and, and I've been guilty of that too. You know what we've done? We've taken whatever the worldly topic of the day is, whatever, whatever we want to rail against, whatever we want to preach against, whatever we want people to stop doing, and we put it in here and we say, that's what it means to love the world. And we look at this, and all we hear is the stop loving the world. But John said, if any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. But you know what I think we miss in that is I think we miss the, the flip side to that. Because if we love the Father, if we really and truly love and pursue the heart of the Father, there won't be room in our heart for the world. See, see we, we've tried to reduce it down to what we do and don't do. And I'm suggesting to you that the people of God should be people who are so in love with the Lord that no other love comes close. That no other love can live in our heart. Here's why it's true. You and I will love someone or something. We can't help that. We are wired that way. I don't care who you are. You might be one of those people who say, I don't need anybody. No, no, no. The truth is you're going to love somebody even if it's you. You're going to love somebody. You're going to worship somebody. You're going to stand in awe of somebody. And it'll either be the world or it'll be the Father. And I suggest this morning that we just need to become people who simply love the Father so much that there's no room in our heart to love the world. Interestingly enough, Jesus said to his disciples, the world hates you because it hates me. Can I tell you something? The world hates you. There is nothing the world is going to ever offer you that's going to be good for you. It might feel good in the moment. It might seem to be best in the moment. But nothing is going to be good for you that the world has to offer. And Jesus said, the world has hated me. Do you realize what Jesus did for you? Do you realize that he came and lived a sinless life? He loved people who didn't love him back. And at the end of the day, they nailed him to the cross as your substitute. He took your sin and died in your place on the cross. He did that for you. So let me ask you something. Why would you give yourself to loving a world that hates your Savior? That hates the Savior who did that for you? Would you bow with me, please? Every head is bowed and every eye is closed. In the quiet stillness of this moment, will you just listen for a moment? Some of you know nothing about the Father's love. You know, you've heard about it. You've heard churches sing about it, talk about it. But you really don't know anything about the love of the Father. Because the simple truth is that this great God, this heavenly Father we talk about, loved the world so much that He gave His only Son that we who believe in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Scripture says this is how you know 
the Father's love, that Jesus died for you. That's how it is demonstrated to us. And so if you would like to know this love of the Father that can change your life, that is eternal and it is perfect and it is unconditional and it will take you right where you are and make things out of you you have not even begun to dream. Because he has promised us not just eternal life in heaven, but he has promised us abundant life here and now. He's promised us a relationship with Him that will satisfy the deepest longings of our heart. And if you want to know this love of the Father, it simply begins when you turn away from your sin, away from your sinfulness. And you say, oh God, I realize I'm a sinner and I know my sin has separated me from you. And right now I place my faith and trust in your son Jesus and in him alone for my salvation. Just call in the name of the Lord and ask him to save you. Tell him that you're placing your trust in him alone because you know he's the only way of salvation, the only hope. Ask him to forgive you of your sin and to save you. And the Bible says all who call on the name of the Lord in that kind of faith, believing in him and in what he did for us, can be saved today. You can know the great love of the Father right where you are right now. Just call on his name. Maybe you're watching from home or somewhere else that you've tuned in or you're here in this room. Place your trust in Christ alone. But this morning, for those of you who are already believers, can I ask you a question? Have you found yourself falling in love with the world? Have you found yourself loving the Father too little because you've been loving the world too much? Right here, right now, right where you are, would you say something like this to the Lord? Just ask Him, God, please teach me to love you. Please help me fall in love with you. God, teach me from day to day how to love you with all of my heart so that there's no room for the world that hates you in my heart. Cry out to him and ask him that because you're going to love him or you're going to love the world, but not both. And for the record, just being around Christian people won't stop that. Paul said about a young man named Demas that Demas had left him and gone away because he loved this present world too much. He was in the presence of the Apostle Paul and still fell in love with the world. God help us. It's us and the Father. Do you love him enough to not love the world? Heavenly Father, this morning, in the name of the Lord Jesus, we thank you for loving us, for loving us enough to let your Son die on the cross for us, and for inviting us into an eternal relationship with yourself. It's not a relationship that will pass away like the world and its lusts will. It's a love that will last and grow for all of eternity. Oh God, thank you for that love. Thank you for inviting us into that love, for loving us that much. And oh God, I pray today that right here in this place, in this moment, that every child of God would cry out and plead with you to teach them how to love you, how to love you so much with all of their heart that their love for you fills up their heart. There's no room to love the world that's fading away. God, don't let it just be about what we do or don't do. Let it be that our whole lives are a response to your love for us and our love for you. God, may we love you because you first loved us. And we pray all of these things in the strong and matchless name 
of our King of kings and Lord of lords, the one at whom every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess the name of Jesus.